Hey, welcome back to Management 760. I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, this lecture is going to be uh, 2B, so this is going to be some more advanced material uh, from what we started in the first lecture of the second week on leading strategically. Uh, the title of, of this PowerPoint uh, is The Leadership of Strategy, and I think just like all the topics in our course, uh, th this is a crucial topic for us to discuss and to carry on after the uh, uh, discussion of Chapter 2 in the textbook. If you go to slide 2, the essence of when CEOs and their top management teams try to lead their strategy, it, it's basically fighting to have your sources of competitive advantage to be and stay sustainable. A mouthful I know, but we will uh, spend the rest of the lecture teasing out that notion. If you go to slide three, uh, we want to start talking about this topic by looking at the sustainability of superior performance and what Chris Arduous of Harvard refers to as single loop learning. So you can see on the slide, uh, let's, we've got a strategy, we've got a strategy framework. Think of the five questions that Roger Martin ask in his book and we took a look at in, in uh, week 1B lecture and you've seen him in the video. So just think for now that's the strategy of a firm. Think about the strategy of Legos, that the uh, about the case that you're working on. Well any strategy, and by the way let me set out this definition or remind you. Uh, I like to refer to a firm strategy as its strategy framework. You're going to see it's more complex than just a simple statement of a, uh, a vision or a mission statement that we discussed uh, a couple lectures ago. But any strategy framework has planned results. Planned total shareholder return, planned sales growth rate, planned operating profit uh, growth rate, etc. And in slide four, uh, let's say a year goes by and we're able to measure our actual results. Notice if there's a difference between our planned results and our actual results, we have a gap. So the question is, what do we do about that gap? And you'll see in Legos, in the early, early years of Legos, they made some disastrous decisions in closing their performance gap. Well, we could do one of two things. We could change the strategy, or we could change the planned results to bring planned and actual into alignment. We may determine as a top management team that our planned results were too aggressive. You remember the discussion of SMART goals. And we can work this loop. This is why it's called the single loop learning. We can change the strategy and keep the planned results the, the same and see if we lessen the gap. In other words, where planned and actual are the same. Or like I said, we can lower uh, our, our, our planned expectations and the planned results. We can work that cycle until the cows come home many times and it still won't work. Many times it will. We can find that tinkering with the strategy framework, uh, making changes in marketing or sales or manufacturing might do the job for us. Sometimes the problems in the leadership of strategy are a little bit more deep and insidious. So slide, <coughs> slide five uh, introduces the notion of double loop learning. And you, 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 as you can see, I like to find, define uh, in extending Chris Arduous's work in my consulting work over the years, is the question is, is what is the mental model of why you thought the strategy would work in the first place? This lies behind any strategy framework. What if your mental model was wrong? As you can see, you can do the single loop sort of spinning around all you want and if you have a faulty mental model lying at the back of your strategy framework you're never going to improve it. Uh, slide six talks about the Encyclopedia Britannica example and I'm going to give you a real short uh, form of the explanation. I think everybody's probably familiar with Encyclopedia Britannica. I know growing up we had a set and we got the the annual uh, yearbook which is an update. For many years, uh, certainly in the United States, parents felt that the best thing they could do for their children was to buy them a set of encyclopedias. And remember, they had a competitor in World Book, 
Funk and Wagnalls, there were a couple of other competitors. Well, just to give you, and remember, you don't have to be totally an expert in accounting and finance to understand what I'm about ready to say. The sales price uh, for a set of, of encyclopedias was about $1,500. The cost to manufacture and deliver those was about $395 a set. And the, for those of you who are too young to remember, their, their go-to market approach, how they went to market, was door-to-door -door selling. So they had a sales force that would cover the United States and basically walk, on, you know, walk up, knock on the door uh, of, a, of a home that they knew didn't have a set of encyclopedias and try to make the sale. Very expensive way to sell those, right? Well, that was part of their business model back then. Well, Bill Gates of Microsoft had a completely different idea. He bought the content, you know, the, the encyclopedic content from the bankrupt Funk and Wagnalls, and he digitized it, and he turned that into Encarta. Uh, again, from yesteryear, uh, that was part of Microsoft Works. Microsoft Works was a simpler version of Microsoft Office. Originally, I believe part of that package in Carta cost about $25. Within six months, he was giving it away for free. Now, the cost to manufacture, if you will, one unit, originally it was in a CD, was about 25 cents. Hmm, something is wrong here. A, a set of encyclopedias for $1,500 and a cost to deliver of $395 versus a cost to make one unit of 25 cents and then all of a sudden uh, giving the product away for free because it was bundled up in, in Carta. Well, when the top management team of Encyclopedia, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica found out about this, their first reaction was, by the way, this was around 1983, uh, their first reaction was, oh, computers are just a fad. It's just it's going to go away. So sales of Encyclopedia Britannica continued to erode. And uh, they finally said, uh, well, we've got a problem. Yeah, we've got a problem. Because what did Bill Gates do? He changed the mental model of parents. No longer it was giving them a set of encyclopedias. It was giving their child a computer on which they could learn. Now, I realize there's, there's, there's um, downsides to computers and children. We all know about uh, pornography and that kind of a thing. But uh, still, Bill Gates... Uh, was really just tagging along with a changing mental model about computers. This went on and on and on, and uh, Encyclopedia Britannica almost went bankrupt before it um, was sold out to a Swiss financier. So you can see the power of a faulty mental model. The Encyclopedia Britannica executives worked the single loop till the cows come home. Uh, they changed the strategy, they changed their planned results, but what was the same was that faulty mental model of the business. So if we go to slide seven, let's make some, and, and the next two slides after that, let's make some key definitions. And we can diagnose the problems of any company, and you're going to be asked to do this for Legos, by looking at how well the executives execute its major strategic initiatives. And you'll see initiatives are, are any piece of work in a firm that's, ex, that's it's big, it's a big project. It's, it's expected to directly increase the market value of the firm or total shareholder return as we discussed from 1B. Uh, so think of new product development, a new R&D initiative, a brand new manufacturing initiative with, that's expected to drastically lower the cost of manufacture. Those would be initiatives or what I like to call strategic initiatives. The ongoing work of the firm is the day-to-day -day work in the business. It's found everywhere in the functions, processes, geographies, and in the corporate center that keep the business going. Both kinds of work are equally important, so there's no value judgment that strategic initiative work is more important than ongoing work. But we can diagnose those problems and issues in a company by just looking at how well the strategic initiatives get executed. If you go to slide eight, 
uh, in, in my work over the last 30 years, I have found that any established firm has a mix of four kinds of barriers. And the, starting on, on slide eight, we're going to go in the order that uh, it's the most easy and to see the barriers and to remove them from easiest to most difficult. So the easiest are what I call subject matter barriers. And that is basically the stuff of your industry that has come into disagreement or uncertainty uh, in the industry. So for instance, if I didn't know how to make this coffee cup and I wanted to know how to make it, that's a subject matter barrier. I'd put a team on it, we would understand the properties of ceramics, we would understand the, how we would manufacture these things in 5,000 you know, at a time. In other words, making one of these things, those of you who might uh, know how to do pottery, it's easy to make one. It's not easy to make 5,000 in a production run that are put into cartons that are stacked to where they won't break when we ship them. That's a subject matter barrier. Barrier. By the way, these can be very thorny problems, but they're always the easiest to identify and remove. The next up in the scale are process barriers. And basically, these are anything that causes a company to be too slow. Uh, it causes the cycle times of the processes. We'll learn about processes later on in the course. Uh, it causes the cycle times to be too long. People mess up all the time. They've got to do a lot of rework in those. Rework is super frustrating. And, and it causes our cost to increase and customer satisfaction to fall. Uh, on slide nine, uh, we move then to structure barriers. We will discuss that later. But think of the organizational chart of a company. I know you're probably going, oh my gosh, how boring, uh, an organizational chart. But uh, the way a company is structured, and you'll see there in the slide nine, by product, by customer, by technology or geography, many times the way a company is structured is a barrier in itself. It's, it's, uh, the structure makes it difficult for the organization to interface with customers, to know what customers want, to be, uh, you know, what they continue to want, and it in and itself becomes a barrier. Uh, Hewlett Packard ha is no no notorious for changing their organizational structural form about every seven years just to shake things up. Okay, the, the last form of barrier and the most insidious to, and the most difficult to identify and remove are what I call culture barriers. Now, you may have studied culture before as those shared values. We'll talk about that later. But in the context of, of implementing key strategic initi initiatives, and we'll see Legos is going to have a number of them by the time you get to the end of the case study. These are biases, blind spots, faulty mental models in the company that cause, you can read for yourself, that cause all kinds of problems. Inertia, delays, disastrous decisions, what have you. Think of the Encyclopedia Britannica example. Um, if you go to slide 10, uh, this is an interesting um, uh, my adaptation to a famous book published in 1994 by Gary Hamill and C.K. Prahalad called Competing for the Future. And, uh, you know, if I were going to do this face to face in class, we would kind of have it build. But if you t start from the left and you take a look at culture barriers, for instance, an unrivaled track record. IBM had that for a number of years. They can mistake momentum for real leadership. In other words, they sort of fall asleep at the wheel. Also, a culture barrier can be just simply having too much money and too many resources. Problem IBM had for a number of years as well. And you can have simply a view that resources will win out. In other words, we can throw money at any problem and it will, it will win the day. That can lead to a little sense of urgency in the firm. Uh, going to the middle part of slide 10, uh, we can have, uh, again, culture barriers. We can have what, what I like to call deep down recipes. These are those faulty mental models, another term for that. And that can lead to the inability of the, of the team to challenge its own dogma, what we saw in Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, a process barrier is we can simply have lack of vision, lack of entrepreneurship. You remember the entrepreneurship orientation we talked about uh, in, in Chapter 2. 
And, and if we have that, we can have a culture uh, that wants to stay with the status quo and, it, and it, it just kills what I like to call master builders and leaders in companies. And that can lead to a situation of the firm unable to escape its past. Lastly then, moving to the right, uh, a process barrier can be just a lot of uncoordinated initiatives. At the very end of the semester, we'll take a look at a chapter from my book called The New Science of Strategy Execution, where we talk about the initiative management process. Those, uh, if we have a lot of uncoordinated initiatives, what we find is usually the, the easiest ones get done. The real tough bet the company initiatives don't get done. Uh, and in culture, we can have a compliance and a fear culture. Oh, that's horrible. And that can lead to a situation where only the safest initiatives get done. If we have a condition uh, like that in the firm, uh, critical initiatives can get stalled. You add all those three together, little sense of urgency, unable to escape the past, critical initiatives getting stalled, we have the risk that the market changes faster than, than the company can change. Again, think Encyclopedia Britannica. So how can we start building a model of the leadership of strategy that your team can take in uh, with you as you think about leading Legos? Well, notice we can put at the top of slide 11 the single loop and the double loop learning. We can introduce the mix of four barriers. Going to slide 12, that rests on a foundation. You remember in lecture 1B, we talked about the strategy framework needing to drive a wedge between our cost to make and deliver and how much our customers were willing to pay. We would like to have the cost be as low as possible and the customer willingness to pay to be as high as possible. Think Apple. Uh, you may not know this, but it's tablets, iPhones enjoy a pretty low cost of manufacture because they do all of that in China with a very, very high uh, uh, willingness to pay in its customer group. Slide 13 then talks about key dimensions of your model of the leadership of strategy. And you'll notice there's, there's two uh, sides of a pole. And let's talk about the left pole first, and then we'll talk about the right pole. So the left would be uh, we're in very capital intensive businesses where we have to make a lot of irreversible commitments. If we need to build three new factories, that's an irreversible commitment. Uh, if we have to build 10 new distribution centers, uh, as Jeff Bezos did in the early days of Amazon, that's an irreversible commitment. We just can't walk away from it. And there we find that the stated strategy uh, is, is very important. The, the um, formulated stated strategy is something uh, that we find in that left side of your model. Usually you'll have top-down planning and most often top management, the top management team will be involved. That's one model of the leadership of strategy and it can work. The right side is pretty much just the opposite where we have total flexibility. Uh, the strategy is an emergent strategy. It's bubbling up everywhere. You remember our discussion from Henry Mintzberg. We see entrepreneurship at low levels and a more democratized strategy making process that gets a lot of people in the firm involved. Think Google. That side can work. And folks, what I want to tell you in, in my 30 years in the field, you're going to see blends of these dimensions really working in firm by firm. They almost have to be made custom made for a firm. So slide 14 puts it all together uh, into an overall model of the leadership of strategy. And I think as you continue to read and master the Legos case, you're going to be able to tell where that team was and where they ended up in terms of these critical dimensions trying to drive a wedge between cost to make and deliver and cu a customer willingness to pay where ultimately we get actual performance meeting a pretty high bar for planned performance. Lastly, slide 15 is a reminder 
from uh, lecture 1B of uh, my four B's chart. And I would like to think that, that uh, picturing the growth and the market value of the firm moving from the lower left to the upper right as you think about those 16 cells uh, is a pretty good way to also uh, add content to, to your eventual model of the leadership of strategy. Because remember one of the objectives of, of our course is for you to walk away when we finish with your own model of strategic management. Thank you very much.